In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful. And for thy spirit in thee shall be created. And let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Ghost hast instructed the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Isidore of Seville, pray for us. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, we come now to, and this, this is an instruction, and I'll just quickly draw your attention to the back of the book, where St. Ignatius talks about making a choice, a choice in life. On page 213 in the back, page 213 Election or choice. To make a good choice on any matter, whatever, we must first meditate with a pure and upright intention on the end or purpose of our creation, which is the glory of God and our salvation. Therefore, our choice ought never to fall on anything that does not lead us to this end. For it is evident that the means ought always to be subordinate to the end and not the end to the means. Those persons deceive themselves who begin by determining on such and such a state of life, for example, on marriage, and afterward form the resolution to serve God as well as they can in that state. That is to reverse the order, to take the means for the end and the end for the means. It is to tend to God obliquely, so to say, and expect to draw the will of God to ours instead of making ours bow to that of God. We must do just the contrary. First, we must propose for our end what is the true end of man, which is the service of God. Then, with a view to this end, choose such and such a state as marriage, our holy orders, and so forth, and determine our choice by the sole motive of arriving more certainly at our end. In a word, we ought not to decide upon one state in preference to another, but according as one or the other can conduce to the glory of God and our salvation. So, in making a big decision, especially as a state of life, we have to um, have always prominently the, the glory of God, salvation of our soul. What would be the best way to save my soul? Would it be single, married, or religious life? Second article on the matter of choice. All that forms... The matter of election ought of necessity to be good, at least neither bad in itself nor contrary to the principles and maxims of the Church. Two, two kinds of things may be the matter and object of election. One kind is such that the choice once made is unchangeable, for example, the priesthood and marriage. There are other things of which the choice is revocable, for example, such as such employment, such as being a nurse or a, a cook, a cook ecclesiastical or secular, that may be accepted at first and afterwards abandoned for just reasons. <clears throat> uh, jump down to the third article, number one, page 214, number one. When the divine power gives to the will such an impulse that the soul does not and cannot doubt that it ought to follow it. It happened thus to St. Paul and St. Matthew, who were called by Jesus Christ and to many others. So when the divine power makes it very clear to someone that this is his will. Number two, when the Spirit of God makes us discern his good pleasure in a manner sufficiently clear and evident by the application of his grace to our hearts, it is by submitting the consolation of the different movements we feel on the rules of the discernment of spirits that we distinguish this divine action which always bears with it the characteristics of God himself. Three, on the top, page 215, when our spirit enjoying a great calm, our soul free from agitation and exercising freely its natural powers, and this is done a lot on retreat, our understanding enlightened as it always is in its operations when conducted with rectitude by the light of the divine word, 
we make choice of the most proper means to lead us surely and easily to our end. This end is the glory of God and our salvation. We set this truth before us as an established principle, and as a consequence on our way to arrive at this term we choose among all the states of the ch that the Church authorizes, the one that will best of all lead us to it. If, if neither the testimony of our senses struck by the divine power nor that of our heart moved by the Spirit of God succeed in fixing our choice, we must appeal to the testimony of our spirit enlightened by eternal truth, and we must have recourse to the following methods. So one is still determining religious life, married life. One, propose to yourself the object of your determination, for example, such a state or such an employment. Should it be embraced? Ought it, ought it to be renounced, and thus of all that can become matter of election. To keep in view this truth, my end is in glorifying God to save myself, prevent your will from pronouncing prematurely either for or against the object in question. Establish yourself rather in a perfect equilibrium so as to turn entirely and immediately to the side in which you recognize the greatest interest is for the glory of God and your salvation. Three, beg of the divine goodness to enlighten your spirit and incline your will towards the calling you should choose, without, however, neglecting to assist yourself by reasoning based on faith in order to seek and discover the will of God, which is to decide your choice. Four, weigh exactly the for and against. So this is a very important point here. What advantages, what assistance, such as such an employment or state of life, presents to enable you to arrive at your end? On the contrary, what dangers, what obstacles await you in it? Examine in the same way the opposite state. What means it offers you are what perils, what resources, or what difficulties. 5, top of page 216. After this examination, compare both sides, and without listening to the suggestions of the flesh, decide for that which appears the most according to sound reason. 6, to the choice being made, have recourse to prayer. Offer your resolution to God and beg of him, if it is agreeable to him, to receive it and confirm you in it. So, let's take a look at some of these points, which regard our vocation, our, how, what do we do to fulfill the will of God in our life? Now, most of you good Ladies are already settled in your state of life. You just have to become saints in your state of life. Vocare means to call, and we are all called in a general way to holiness. This is the will of God, your sanctification, says the Holy Ghost. We're all called to be saints. Yeah, but I'm married. I'm busy. Well, you're still meant to be a saint. Yeah, but I'm single and working. Yeah, but you're still meant to be a saint. That is the will of God, and you can become saints in any state of life. Think of St. Joseph Benedict Labre. Poor St. Joseph Benedict Labre. His vocation was never to find his vocation. Did you know that? <laughs> Poor St. Joseph Benedict Labre. He would go to the monastery. Wasn't God's will. Seminary. Wasn't God's will. Brothers. Wasn't God's will. He tried many religious houses. Wasn't God's will. Marriage. Didn't ever work out. He was always looking for his vocation, and he ended up being a beggar in the streets of Rome. But being a beggar, he talked to many people, many other beggars, and led many of them to heaven and confession. So he, he became kind of an apostle in Rome. Isn't that interesting? God's ways. So he found his niche in just sanctifying a beggar's life. But that's a rare vocation, most, most settled in either religious life, marriage life. Single life is not a calling as such. It isn't a calling as such. But many just, that is God's will that they just be single. And in that single state, sanctify their soul. But no single person aside from a special vocation of hermitage, which is rare, and old father Urban Snyder used to say, a hermit must have nerves of steel because he faces the devil one-on-one, -on -one. and normally a hermit, like for the Trappists, they, they must have lived 
in the community life for at least 20 years. So says Father Urban Snyder, who was a Trappist monk himself. So you just can't say, I'm going to just going to be a hermit, because one must be chiseled and prepared for such a battle, because the devil can attack, and men are not meant to live alone. But in rare vocations, God wants some to live alone, but they live for the whole of society. By their prayer and penance, they help the whole church and host all of society. So a single person must help society in some way, either by teaching or hospital medicine, medical work, or in some field where they help the common good, such as the mind of St. Thomas in the church. So a single life in itself is not a vocation, but if someone is in that state and it's not clear to them where to go, they still must help the common good. Or nannying, you know, like nannying and teaching children, that's, that's fine. All are called to sanctity, and sanctity is all are commanded to keep the Ten Commandments. That's not an option. In any state of life, we must keep the Ten Commandments. In the way modern world is, the Ten Commandments is become heroic to keep it. To keep the commandments today is nearly heroic. Blasphemy everywhere. Ignoring of God's laws. Sanctifying the Lord's day is just out the window. Working on Sundays. People just work on Sundays like it was just an ordinary day. And that offends God very much. Any manual work is forbidden by the divine law. And that's why Our Lady of La Salette said France would be punished with the famine and Ireland, the potato famine, because of two great sins, working on Sunday and blasphemy, taking God's name in vain. So what do you do if you're in the workplace or you're on a bus or on the plane and someone clearly says the name of our divine Lord, the name of God or the Virgin Mary, and you, it's loud and clear, it's unmistakable, a blasphemy. What do you do? Well, you should just say out loud, blessed be the name of God, or blessed be the name of Jesus Christ forever. Just make instant reparation, and <laughs> that'll make them think twice about what they say. And if they say something, what do you, what do you say that for? Well, if you blaspheme God, I'm just making reparation. He's our God, so we shouldn't speak that way about him. Would you talk that way about your mother? Drop her name when you're angry, like, like mud? No. Well, why do we do it with God's name? That's the best thing. Second best is just say a prayer of reparation right away in, in your heart. But it's far more edifying if, if you just speak up. And our Lord will reward you very much for that. Very much. Because it's not comfortable. You're making waves. But that's what the world needs. A little bit of wave making. A little disturbance to shake this liberal fake castle that the world has built without God. Uh, fourth commandment. Yeah, it's just become normal to, to disobey one parent, one's parents or one's husband and just walk away. Fifth commandment, drunkenness. Well, that's always been in the human history. Uh, murder, of course, abortion and all that. Euthanasia is a horrible thing being legalized and you know we're back to worse than pagans the canaanites sacrificed their little babies to satan to the moloch and jeremiah the prophet says they would pound the drums in the valley of topat they would pound the drums to drown out the screaming of the infants thrown into the fire so they were already pounding rock music back then to drown the guilty conscience sixth commandment oh that's that's just drunk like water today and now with pornography available everywhere anyway and no expense anonymously uh it's very dangerous extremely dangerous 
And as Pope Leo XIII says, enslaves man. You heard Archbishop Lefebvre mention that in the reading. Pornography makes slaves of men to their passions. It also messes up the brain. <clears throat> and it weakens men. And it can really harm marriages. It can really harm... It does more harm to men because men are more visual. It does harm to men and women. But it's... Men are more prone to that because men are more visual. So, you, uh, parents got to watch internet in their home. Monitored. Never let your kids go on it unmonitored. It's just common sense. And now we got even traditional parents who let their kids have their own cell phone in their 13, 14, 15. That's, that's just insanity. 16, 17. Maybe when they're 18, 19, 20, maybe. But it's insanity. It'd be safer to give your kids a pet tarantula, a poisonous tarantula. There might be less danger of death for their soul. So we got to watch these things. Seventh commandment, stealing. Yeah, that's become quite a common as well. I hear that in the shopping stores and supermarkets. Yes, Father, people steal all the time. And I ask them, well, do, you, do you call the police on them? No, because nothing comes of it and it just costs more money to go through a, law, a, a, a lawsuit. So stealing has just become normal and it's, it's wrong, really wrong. Eighth commandment, uh, you know, yeah, slander of neighbor and all that, rash judgments, de detraction. Ninth commandment, that's coveting another spouse other than one's married husband or wife. That's encouraged by the modern music, movies, immodest fashions, very deadly. And then jealousy of others' success or progress, our material gain. Yeah, the, the Ten Commandments breaking them has become quite the norm, hasn't it? It's just daily headline news. So to keep the commandments, you're going against a lot. You're going against the whole spirit of the world, and it's heroic in these days. So you got to be heroic. We need heroic heroines. We need women of strong faith who shine. You are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Our Lord says, especially a, a good woman, she's powerful. So, um, all are called to sanctity and, and keeping the commandments. And on the lower end of the scale, actually it should be the other way around, but here we go. This is the lower, this is the bronze. Marriage is the bronze. Um, the active life is the silver and the contemplative life is the gold of all the states of life. So marriage is, is on the bottom, but it's sacred and it's good. And it's willed by God, obviously, and it's, it's a holy sacrament. Um, but let it be said, the first purpose of marriage is the begetting of children and their proper upbringing in virtue. So... What should a marriage couple do when they get married? Honey, I love you to death. We're going to be pure before marriage. We're, going to, we're not going to act married before marriage. But once we're married, we just take God's, the, the children God sends. Oh, yes, dear. That sounds a wonderful idea. Well, it is. It is. And it might be number eight that becomes a saint. It might be number nine that becomes a good doctor that invents a new medicine to help cure cancer or whatever. That's actually already been done, but the Pfizer has, these wretched companies have squelched them. Um, what else? It might be number 17 that becomes a holy bishop. Remember Padre Pio had a, a woman in confession. He told her, close your eyes, madam, because she confessed an abortion. He said, close your eyes, what do you see? And she said, I see a huge field and filled with all sorts of people of all races and different colors. If 
but I see one prominent among them who's dressed in white. And Padre Pio said, that's your son that you killed. He was destined to be the Pope. Wow. Wow. So, so when you're married, if you get married, and those who you are married, obviously you take the children God sends. If God sends children, blessed be God. Sometimes he doesn't. And that's a big cross for many couples. However, many of us priests have seen this, that when a couple can't have children and they start adopting, somehow, some way, they just start having children of their own. It does happen frequently. And it's, it's quite funny to see. But they must love their adopted children like their own and not favor one over the other, if that happens. So the first purpose, yes, is, is children and also their proper upbringing. So the right discipline, the right upbringing and virtue, teach them to pray. And the role of the father is very important in upbringing children. Some men get the idea that raising children is just the mother's job, and that is way off the mark. Those, those husbands need to be corrected and spanked by the priest. There was a great Monsignor in Nashville, Kentucky. Um, I, there was an old Polish couple that lived in Nashville. And I stayed over, I said mass there many years ago. And, and I stayed over at their house and they had a big painting of this Monsignor who, they, who was beloved by the parishioners. But this Monsignor was known to, in one case, the mother and the children were at home and the father would squander the labor of the day in the bar. And the mother complained to the priest, I have no, more, no money to feed the kids, hardly pennies to feed the kids, and my husband's spending it all in the bar. So Monsignor got wind of that and he went one night to the bar. He walked right into the bar. Padre, what are you doing here? And he found the, the husband of that wife, picked him up by the collar, dragged him out in front of the bar, put him up against the wall, and said, what are you doing to your family? And why are you insulting God like this? And the man, you know, it took that, but it straightened him out. Sometimes a good priest can really... Uh, straightened out some loose bolts and it did in that case and he straightened out and he became a good father started leading the family rosary and all that so sometimes they need to be shaken out of their torpor so the second person purpose of marriage of course is the love and support of the spouses that means forgive each other pray for each other help each other and the wife the wife, the Holy Ghost speaks about the nagging wife is like a leaking roof. Um, know when to speak to your husband. Know when to bring up important negative things that you got to talk about. But it's not, usually it's not when your husband gets right home, he's tired from work, he's hungry. That's usually not the time to bring it up. And he'll get annoyed with his wife if, he, if she does. So the wife should have a, a sense of when to bring things up. After he has dinner, after he has a good dessert, maybe a good beer, and the kids are said the rosary as a family, and the kids are in bed. Then you got some quiet time together. That might be the time to do it. Or on the weekends when you can talk alone for an hour. But the wife has to know, you know... <coughs> Because the husbands work hard. They work very hard. And uh, it's not good to be a preachy wife. Husbands will hear preacher preaching from priests. They'll hear it from maybe their parents or grandparents. But a wife shouldn't be preachy to her husband. By that, I mean, you know, always being the authority correcting him. He doesn't like that. And men are proud anyway, so... Um, a wife should approach these things sweetly. I know one wife, she would just put good books by his bedside or his favorite couch and, you know, hopefully pick up and read. Um, 
that doesn't mean if there's something serious and very urgent and important that you ignore it. You have to approach it, but you have to judge when there's the best and what is the best way, and sometimes just straight out tell them there's something very important we have to talk about. And of course, never raise your voice. Uh, also, with the wife, there is a, a danger to, let's say you've been married 25 years, and there's been a, a rough road, let's say. It hasn't been a perfect marriage, and there's been some rough bouts in it. Well, there is a tendency sometimes with the wife to bring up all the past that has been long forgotten and long forgiven, and she brings it all up because she's so angry, she just wants to throw everything like mud in his face. Don't do that. We must imitate the sacred heart of our Lord. He doesn't do that to us. When you go to confession and, and you're forgiven, it's forgotten. It never comes back again, unless we fall, you know, go back to occasions of sin. So same with your husband. Don't throw old mud back at him. It's not good. Leave it in the past and leave it forgiven. You must have that supernatural attitude and just deal with the matter at hand. It's not good to bring up old mud and old hurts. And that goes for the husband as well, but it's usually the wife who does this. So, uh, and the wife has her sweet and good way to, uh, to get to her husband by sweetness and kindness. And look at some of these saints. Think of uh, Blessed Anna Maria Taiji. <laughs> She's the wife that would sweep in the floor, be elevated off the ground in ecstasy. Our Lord spoke to her a lot, and she actually made messages to Pope Pius IX, who she knew personally. Her body's incorrupt in Italy. And her husband was not all that devout, and he wasn't a pleasant man. He was kind of a, you know, hard-headed, hot-headed Italian. If dinner wasn't ready on time, he'd be angry, throw break dishes. But her attitude was not to fight him face to face and scream at him in front of the kids and throw, I'm not cooking supper tonight. None of that. And that's another little point as well. If you do have a fight, you don't have revenge on the daily duties. You don't say, I'm not cooking tonight. You deserve that. No. If you fight, you cook dinner still. If you fight, you still do the normal chores of home. For the love of God, you never, you never rob the house of, of your duties, right? So anyway, Blessed Anne, Anna Maria Taiji, she always dealt with her husband sweetly. And she said, honey, I'll try to do better with uh, getting dinner on time. And, and, you know, she just had to work with this temperament of her husband. And a lot of ladies don't want to hear that because it's the harder path. And with the modern feminism, they want to raise their fist and their voice and defend my rights. But that, what good does that do in a marriage? It just intensifies the fight, intensifies the friction. And if you have a, hus a loving and humble husband, God bless you. you got a great man. But if you don't, sweetness and kindness must at least be found in the wife. And that's not easy. It is the harder thing to ask to be humble and quiet and just keep doing your duty for the love of God. And go to this heart of Jesus. Complain to him. Many saints suffered these. And, and, and uh, of course, St. Elizabeth of Portugal, none of you will have her misery. Her husband was a pompous son of a gun. He abused her, smacked her, verbally abused her. He even went with other women, and they had children, and she would take those illegitimate children even as her own. <laughs> and then she would often feed the poor. He would get upset with that. 
honey, where's the rest of the, where's the rest of the hamburger meat? Well, there were some beggars that came to the door, honey, and I couldn't refuse to give them something. What'd you do that for? So this is what he did, she dealt with day in and day out. And one day there were, there was just beggars. I guess she found some beggar that was completely helpless and destitute and really in need with wounds all over him. She took him and placed him in their own marriage bed. So when he came home <laughs> and walked into his room and opened the bed curtains, because in those days they often had curtains around their beds, he saw, he heard about this beggar. He was angry. And he walked up to the curtain. What do you have beggars in our bed now? You're going crazy. Opens the curtains. And he sees Jesus crucified on the bed. Our Lord on the bed with crown of thorns, nails in his hands and feet. And that took that. That was, that was the grace for him because of the sweetness, the patience, the prayers, the endless bearing with another's injuries, which was one of the works of mercy, don't forget, that won that grace for her husband and his conversion so that he would actually die a good and holy death. He saved his soul because of her. Now, most modern women would be out of that house after the first year. They'd be out of there because my rights, feminine rights, right to divorce, and so forth. But that's the saints for you. And we're called to be saints. And if you're married, you know, when, you're, when you get married, you don't, you don't know all your husband's faults and his quirks and even his sins. You don't know them, but then you discover them, and then it's not the Hollywood forever, is it? But that's when virtue really kicks in, that you love him for the love of God. You bear patiently with his faults, and you, you can complain, but do it sweetly and try to avoid head-on collisions. And I've seen many, many good marriages. And, <laughs> yes, it becomes quite humorous when they get older, you know. Oh, father, all she, all she does is talk my ear off. And they make jokes about each other. It's kind of funny. But they've lived through a lot of rough times, and they forgive each other. And it's beautiful to see an old marriage in, in their old age and faithful still. And you know it's been rough. It has been rough. Anyway, so the married life is, uh, is, is not necessarily easier than religious life. How many priests, when the priests get together, say, wow, I'm glad we are married to God. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't mean it's easier. No way. <clears throat> But it is holy, and many saints are married. And you're meant, if you're married, you're meant to be a saint in your, mar in your married state. You're meant to be. All right, the other higher call, friend, come up higher. So this is when our Lord invites souls, he invites many too, not all, but many, to what's called the evangelical councils, that is, the, the vows of poverty, chastity, obedience. In the religious life, as in your case, it'd be the life of a sister or a nun. The contemplative life where they are consecrated to Jesus Christ, the King. They are brides of Christ. And some religious orders, the nuns on the day of their vows will actually wear a full wedding dress and a ring. Receive a ring because they're espoused to Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, there, there is no better husband for a woman than our Lord Jesus Christ. He can be rough on his friends, too. He can be actually like a, a rough husband, you know. Think of St. Teresa. Both of them, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Gertrude, St. Mathilde, St. Madeleine, St. Marguerite Bourgeois, the ones in Quebec. All these beautiful brides of Christ, they all suffered in some way. So our Lord is no less a rough husband than an earthly husband, you know. 
He does sometimes give heavy crosses to his brides. He does. So we gotta expect that. So there's no there's no state of life that's not without thorns at all. We're meant to be saints in whatever state of life. However, it is easier to become a saint in this life. Easier because you have less chains pulling you to the world. Poverty frees you from paying bills, frees you from worry about material things. It's a freedom. Chastity frees you from the dutiful uh, duty towards one, one spouse. Frees you from that attachment to the world. Frees you about having to please a husband. Frees you about getting more clothes and makeup to please him and all that. You focus on our Lord. Obedience is a freedom from our own will, actually. That our will obeys the rule of the given religious house, of a traditional Catholic order, without compromise, which is getting hard to find now. But anyway, obedience... So, poverty and chastity obedience follows what our Lord said. If whoever wishes to come after me, let him sell all he has, poverty, renounce himself, chastity, and follow me, obedience. So these are the evangelical counsels, which is the invitation to come higher. And it's much easier to, to save your soul, and quite honestly, it's a very extremely happy life. So happy. Whenever you get a group of nuns together, they're always laughing. Yes, I used to give conferences to the Carmelites up in Spokane, Washington, the Brides of Christ, and uh, just a just such a healthy, pure laugh. And when you give a conference to them, it's it's with a grate and a curtain from, so you can't see them. <laughs> so the priest is giving a conference to a curtain. <laughs> But you can hear the innocent laughter on the other side, and it is beautiful. The Brides of Christ and Holy Nuns, they're powerful. Nuns are very powerful, and when they are in full habit and when seen publicly, it's very powerful. Good Holy Nuns, they're gone now. England used to be full of them. England used to be full of religious orders, both before the French Re Protestant Revolution and then when Catholicism came back, there was actually a whole order of nuns that came to the southern England on one of the islands that fled France from the horrible persecutions there. It was a Benedictine order of Mother Cecile, I think it was. Yeah, Mother Cecile. And beautiful, just beautiful. Nuns are powerful. And they have a tremendous influence on society. So that's a huge loss to the public realm when, and even married people. It strengthens their marriage when they see nuns to be faithful to their vows when they see the nuns being faithful to God and priests being faithful to their vows. It helps married people stay stronger, edifies, lifts them up. So in the religious life, one can be the, in the contemplative life or the active slash contemplative life. It was called sometimes semi-contemplative. The active life is teaching or medical. And how many people have converted because of the, the dutiful charity of the nuns? Think of Father Peter Damien in Hawaii who took care of the lepers, and blessed Marianne Cope, she left Syracuse, New York, with some sisters, and they made their way to, by ship, to Hawaii, to help Father Peter Damien. And he told her and her sisters, sisters, God will bless you for your work and protect you. You will never catch leprosy. And the sisters always were cleaning it, they dealt with it, bandages and the whole thing, and this leprosy stinks because they're rotting, you know. Father Damien took up pipe smoking to deal with the smell, but that wouldn't be edifying in sisters, so he uh, they couldn't smoke, but they had to deal with the smell. But they never caught leprosy, Not none of her sisters. Our Lord protected them. 
So those are duties of charity. Basically, you can say there's a religious order, or used to be, for every beatitude, every work of mercy. Visiting the prisoners, feeding the hungry, and taking care of the sick. Teaching. Teaching is a great work of mercy. Teaching. And that's what the modern world really needs. Above all is teaching. True, Catholic, clear teaching. And then the active contemplative life involves active work. Contemplative life are those like the Benedictine nuns or Trappists or Carmelites who only live for the love of God. Their whole life is centered on the love of God. So they do work. They have to keep the place, have a garden usually. They're usually cloistered. And, but it's a beautiful life and a joyous life. And they are special brides of Christ. And we, the world needs them. Oh, do we ever need contemplative orders? Do we priests on the battlefield need the army of nuns and monks and brothers behind us? And then we might as we can also add in here the third order. Third order nuns, that is like Saint Gemma of Galgani, Saint Catherine of Siena even was a third order nun. That is, they are they wear a habit, but they don't necessarily take vows. It's like lay brothers. They they help the priest, they help the church. But they're a little bit nervous about taking vows, but they'll give their life to God. And there's a place for them. There's a place for that. Of course, the priesthood is its own se section of rank. And it's a very high rank of which none of us are worthy. And, of course, you'll never be priest, no matter what Pope Francis says. <laughs> or the next liberal pope, God spare us. Have mercy on us. Please give us a good Pope. If any good Pope could, there could be, it's, it's Archbishop Vigano. Imagine him being Pope. He would consecrate Russia properly. He would condemn Vatican II in the new Mass, in the new Code, and restore tradition, and go back to the pre-55 liturgy, which he's been saying all along that the Society of St. Pius X should go back to. Interesting. So, and a good pope would un unify all the kind of the fragments of tradition and bring it all together. And what a blessing. I hope we live to see that. Keep praying. But in the meantime, you can at least be mothers of priests. Here's a, um, Mrs. Taylor had this in her last retreat, I guess. This is a parish, some little town in what, France? No, Italy. In Italy. Where the parish was so zealous and they had a prayer, they would, the parents would say, the mothers after Mass, praying for vocations from their parish and their families. And God heard their prayers. And look at, all these are priests, brothers, and nuns. Some are St. John Bosco nuns with full habit. Brothers, seminarians, that's people of the parish. Isn't that amazing? Of one town in Italy. Isn't that beautiful? So that should be normal. So at least you can be mothers of priests and brothers and holy nuns. How do you do that? One, never push it down their throat. Don't do that. I've seen it. Oh, Johnny here, he plays Mass and he's going to be a priest. Right, Johnny? And Johnny turns 13, 14, 15, and they're, they're shoving it down his throat. He doesn't want to hear that. It has to be a free choice. He doesn't want to be forced into the priesthood or the nuns or the brothers. He's not going to do it. You're going to drive him away. So let Johnny make that decision on his own. Encourage it. Encourage it. And if he brings it up, you know, I'm thinking of maybe, maybe the seminary. Well, that's good. You should give that thought and you should pray over it to know God's will. One father of a family, he told his sons, you're all going to go to try the seminary. Why? Because St. Thomas says, if you're deliberating on, lip, deliberating on whether to be a priest or a nun or a monk or a brother or married life, if you're deliberating and you, and you don't know for sure, St. Thomas Aquinas says, better to try and see. And if it's not meant for you, It'll be very clear because you got six years, seven years of seminary 
and in your case, convent, you got pre-postulant for six months, postulancy for six months, novitiate for three years, then you make vows, or maybe another three years in novitiate, depending on the person. So there's no big rush, and you can see if that's God's will for you, and if it's not, then you tried, and you can go in peace and go get married, and it'll never bother you later in life, oh, I should have been a nun, I should have been a priest. Maybe I didn't do God's will. So um, that's what St. Thomas says, Better to try and see than not to try at all. That's what he says. Because it's the best thing, and you don't deliberate over the best thing. He says the only deliberation should be, which order should I go to? And for us today, there's not much choice. And for nuns, there are many traditional order of nuns today, but a lot of them are um, attached to the, the, the new SSPX where there's been compromise with Vatican II and the new Mass. So it puts them in a dangerous position. And of course, um, uh, anyway, so I hope we'll start have nuns in New Hampshire down the road. I hope, if God wills, but we'll see. Okay, so that's the higher, That's this is the gold, this is the silver, and that's the bronze. A little bit, of, a little few words about courtship. Sometimes the modern term is dating, but dating is not good. D the modern understanding of dating is go off one-on-one -on -one at age 16, go off one-on-one -on -one with your boyfriend and come back at two in the morning. Well, if you allow that with your kids, you're going to lose them. One, you don't leave a late curfew. Two, you don't let, dating is wrong. You don't go off alone with a boy. You just don't do that. That's, that's called an occasion of sin in our catechism. It's just asking for trouble. And if you love each other, of course it's going to lead to, <laughs> it's going to lead to sin. And they're not plastic. It's just common sense. And this modern dating is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And it in, invites fornication and it ruins, it, it sows weeds into a marriage. So what is, how do we court, how do we do courtship? It's with family and friends. That's the old way. You're this boy who's interested in, in the girl, he comes to the family, meets the father, meets the mother, comes to dinner, comes to the board games and visits. And then he can visit them on some family excursions, but always in the setting of the parish, the family, friends always that's the way to do it and then the old way of chaperones i say old but it's, it's new and it should be good it needs to be restored chaperones is wise and chaperones means you know uh they've been you know fred and barbara have been dating a while they've been meeting each other for a while they know each other's families <laughs> It's about the time when they should probably be just getting engaged, and then maybe they are engaged. Still, when you're engaged, you keep chaperones. And chaperones are, you know, older brother, our older sister, our aunt, our uncle, that just comes with them when they go off to the movies or to a dinner. They don't have to be sitting at the same table, but there's always, you know, Aunt Millie is over there keeping one eye. <laughs> But it's wise. It's the old wise way. It helps these young young couples keep pure, keep healthy, so that on the day of their marriage, they're virgins. And she can honestly wear the white dress. Honestly. And that's a wonderful thing. And when marriages are, are like this, God blesses them abundantly. And they're happy and they're strong. Because, because they never acted married before marriage, when they do unite in the physical union of marriage, it's so powerful, it bends, bonds them together forever. And there's something psychological about it as well, that they're just forever glued. It's willed by God. But the modern world wrecks this with the whole rock and roll culture and the whole disgusting ruining ruination of the young 
So the modern dating invites fornication. Of course, with birth control, it just wrecks the young people, wrecks marriages, throw, throw, grows weeds into it. And let it be also said, a lot of people think, well, heavy kissing is fine before marriage. No, it's not. Heavy kissing is and necking is already a mortal sin if you're not married. Why? Because heavy kissing and necking is meant for the marriage bed and to be, it, it, it's meant by God to begin what's supposed to end in the sacredness of the marital union. That's the purpose of heavy kiss. But a kiss on the cheek is fine. And in many countries, that's normal. You give a kiss on the cheek. Not England, of course. But in uh, Catholic countries like uh, Ireland, I mean, um, Italy and South America, it's very common to kiss on the cheek. In many once Catholic countries, very common and very normal. So that's not a big deal. But uh, lips and necking and all that's already a realm of mortal sin. It doesn't belong in, in courtship. And I knew an old guy who said, when I married my girl, she didn't even know how to have children. She didn't know what, how that, the process, she didn't know. That's how innocent she was. But, you know, they got married and she discovered and they, they were happy, had a happy marriage. So they don't need to have all this science and so-called sex education before they're married. But it is the duty of parents to teach their children and teach them not the, the garbage of the world and the foulness of the spirit of the world, which is which is pure lust and like like salamanders, but the holiness of the purpose of marriage and the beauty of the role of man and woman and the sacredness of the marriage bed for children. All that makes sense in the Catholic teaching and is beautiful in the divine plan of God. But the devil has really tried to wreck this, and pornography especially wrecks, wrecks the, the, the young people, just wrecks them. It really does. And Protestants now have these, these helps from people who are enslaved in pornography, help them out of it. And it, it messes the minds of young men up. You know, the young man used to have to go out of the way to go see a pretty girl and meet her father and go out of the way to earn the honor of having a, a noble girl. But now with the, all these internet pornography, they, they, it ruins all that. It just ruins them. There's so much destruction from it. And the enemies of Christ know this. And the Freemasons said, we will rot the only way to get rid of Catholicism is to rot them and start with the woman. Start with her. So we have to rebuild the Catholic civilization. We've got to rebuild the Catholic family. We've got to rebuild, give God vocations from our large families. We have to have that crusade. And may I invite you, fine British diamonds. We really need a crusade of the Catholic modesty. To be proud to be, and, and boldly so, beautiful and modest. Bring that back. Bring it back. You're worth more than walking around like a, like a loose woman with loose clothes and immodest fashions. You're not worth that. You're not worth the gutter. You're worth much more than that. So let your light shine. And that goes for our American girls, too. We need a real crusade of truly, boldly modest women. And it's powerful. So, enough said. We will... you got about 10 minutes until the next conference for the Incarnation. Oh, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Duties towards grandchildren. Yeah, good point. So when you do have children and they grow up and you're lucky that they keep the faith, that's a blessing. If they don't, you still have a duty towards your grandchildren. Always do duty to pray for them and sacrifice for them. And as much as you can 
feed their soul with good books. And hopefully your children will be wise and not let, let them be ruined and drowned in all the modern technology and internet, but to govern these things wisely. But um, you still have a duty to help them to heaven as loving grandparents and to teach them the wisdom. And it was always normal in the old days that grandparents even live with the family. And that's not easy either. But at least let the grandparents fortify the faith of their grandchildren and be good examples and encourage. Um, it's very good if children can know their grandparents. But uh, however, I do know some families where a good Catholic family have to be careful with their grandparents because they're all liberal and they don't have the faith. So they push, they'll give the kids cell phones without their parents knowing. And they'll push the daughters to have a boyfriend at age 13 because she did. So you got to watch that too. It can be good, it can be poisoned. You got to watch these things. You got to watch these things. But where it's all those who have the faith, and have the same understanding. It's a huge blessing to have grandchildren with their grandparents and the joy for the grandparents to know their grandchildren. A great joy. And it helps them live longer as well. It's willed by God. And that's something that has to be restored as well. The family gatherings with grandma, grandpa, uncles, aunts. But I understand today it's not always easy because not all of them have the faith and they can do a lot of damage. You know, you get an uncle or an aunt bringing in a cell phone, sneaking it to your daughter or son, that's undermining your authority and it can do much damage. So, what a world, huh? What a world. But keep fighting and let's say a little prayer. I'll give you a blessing. Here's the crucifix. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary. Pray for us. Saint Elizabeth of Portugal. Pray for us. Saint Teresa of the Child Jesus. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.